There, there we it go. Is. Okay. All right. Everybody, Perfect. enjoy Nick Ledley, touchthewildphotos.com. We're fighting on through Zoom bombings. Let's keep the Rangeley Burning Festival going. All right. uh, turning over to you, Nick. Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. It's great to see over 100 people here. Um, this presentation was actually listed as um, on wildlife photography, but it basically centers on birds. But I will alert you, there is one token mammal photo in there. Um, so anyways, let's get started. Um, if you see me moving my cursor, that's me simply changing screens or using the cursor as a pointer. So I apologize if that's a distraction. Um, getting started in bird photography, and I titled this, There's No Place Like Home, because that's exactly how I got started doing this, was right in my own backyard. And that's where I'm going to start talking about how to approach bird photography. Um, come on, mouse. There we go. Um, one of the key things is provide natural looking perches, um, which are set up near feeding stations. Um, it makes for much more natural looking photos if you do provide them with natural looking perches. Uh, if you do so, use what's available in your yard. Uh, position near what attracts the birds, which means either food or water, and watch the background behind your perches to make sure that it's not a distraction from the actual photos of the birds itself. And if I'm going too fast, people, please let me know. Oh, come on, there we go. Um, position any perches you set up near cover. So that way, if a predator comes through, they can duck for protection. I've had this happen in my backyard with northern shrikes that have flown in near my feeders and the birds all scatter. My feeders are all positioned near cover so that they have a chance to go hide. Uh, watch for natural perches that they use because often they'll return to them near the feeders before flying into the feeders. Both of these photos were taken in my backyard, uh, obviously after an ice storm on property I used to own down in Whitefield. Um, one of the great ways to find birds is looking for a sit spot. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term sit spot, there's a book I recommend called What the Robin Knows by John Young, which is J-O-N. It is well worth reading on ways to approach and interact with wildlife in a safe and respectful manner. Um, when you're setting up a sit spot, look at the surroundings. Um, do you have fairly clear lines of sight to where the birds are coming in from? Um, mind how the sun goes, meaning where your light source is positioned. If you look at these two images on this slide, both of these locations were selected in such a way that the sun is either coming in from my behind me or from one side. Um, and these were both spots where I was attempting to photograph winter wrens. Um, select your sit spots based on behavior. Um, if you look at the top image in this slide, this is the exact spot where the picture of this winter wren was taken. And the reason I selected this spot was for two reasons. If you see this cedar and this bird tree here, that's where I actually set up the camera. And the reason being is that having those tree trunks behind me tended to break up my shape. And the bird was consistently moving up and down this trunk right here or perching up on these roots of this upturned tree feeding. Um, another thing when selecting sit spots is to create blinds much like this one. Now, this blind was obviously created just by me piling up whatever debris was located at the site. It's not so much designed to hide me to a certain extent, but more just to break up my shape. I don't really tend to build blinds like this where I'm completely enclosed because it interferes with my peripheral vision. So I can't really see where the bird's coming in from, which is sometimes critical because often when they come into a perch or a spot like where this wren was singing, they don't always stay there long. So the more peripheral vision you have, the better in creating these blinds. This blind was sort of designed multi-purpose that I could either hide behind it or could sit in front of it and it would break up my shape because the bird would constantly come in on a path that was from behind the blind around to in front of it, which is the angle that I'm looking at. 
right now. Um, this is a really just a very brief slideshow of me actually out in the field talking about how I evaluate locations for bird photography. I will forewarn you, I'm not going to win any jobs for voiceovers in this thing. And this is the first video I've ever put together. So please bear with me. It's probably going to run three to four minutes. Morning, folks. It's a beautiful morning up here in the Western Mountains of Maine, and I'm in one of my favorite locations for photographing songbirds. As the video goes on, you'll see a large, wide open area and lots of edge habitat, which is the reason that I like it. The particular spot that I'm standing in is partially shaded, and the reason I tend to set my tripod up. Just being in the shade makes me just a little bit less noticeable to the birds. And I've got all this vegetation and limbs right here behind me, which break up my shape. I'll avoid standing in front of this lighter area right here, because that puts me in silhouette and makes my movement just a bit more noticeable than if I'm standing in the shade. The sun is basically coming in from about 90 degrees to my right, which provides Side lighting, which is my favorite light. The area behind the camera that I'm facing is a stand of spruce and small deciduous trees that aren't terribly high. So if a bird comes in and lands in it, I'm not shooting at really an angle. So let's take a walk around and I'll show you a little bit more about this location and why I choose to be here. Let's go. Now we're looking at the spot I mentioned in the first part of the video where the birds come in to feed and sing. Standing in the shaded spot where I set up the tripod. You'll note that it's a fairly short distance between myself and the trees. There's little to nothing in the way to interfere with sight lines or being able to focus on the birds. And the trees are not too tall, so I'm not shooting in an extreme upward angle, which I really don't like. So let's take a walk around and look at the rest of this area. Now you're getting a clear view of the edge habitat that makes spots like this one so effective for bird photography. There are clear sight lines, nothing to interfere with auto focus. I can easily position myself to get the birds in the best light. Oftentimes in spots like this, I'll pick a sit spot in one of these seated areas where I'll stand and observe and photograph the birds for up to 20 to 30 minutes at a time depending upon their activity level. In the next segment, we're going to move on to a different location that I think is a key element to be considered when selecting your bird photography spot. Here we are at our second location, a small pond tucked up in the woods. I really like this spot because its orientation allows me to get the birds in good early morning light. It's just large enough that I'm far enough away from the birds to not spook them, but still close enough to get them large enough in the frame. So I have good cover nearby and plenty of perches along the edge of the pond so I can get reflection shots if possible. It's also shallow enough in certain spots along the edges to provide the birds with places to come in to bathe and to drink. Open stands of deciduous hardwoods, such as this one, are locations I come to fairly frequently for the thrush, nuthatch, and woodpecker species along with the creek. They provide really good sight lines, nice soft light. They don't work very well for warblers because most of them are feeding up fairly high in the canopy. It's a really steep angle to photograph from, one that I don't think lends itself to the very well. Fertile pools, such as this one to my left, offer really good opportunities for bird photography. It has very clearly defined edge habitat, good sight lines, the source of water, and the mix of coniferous and deciduous trees surrounding the fertile pool will attract various species of birds.
Okay, so that covers over basically how I select locations to photograph birds. These are some of the, some of the high points of that. So if people want to take notes, well, this will certainly be available uh, publicly once Maine Audubon gets them posted. A uh, couple of things um, that I didn't go over in the video, some which Doug Hitchcock mentioned yesterday, is logging cuts are a really prime spot to find birds um, because they've got various strata of levels of vegetation that the birds like. Um, and look for trails or woods roads that cut along the sides of a hill. And the reason for that is it allows you into a view into higher parts of the canopy sometimes on the downhill slope where the birds are likely to be feeding. Um, if any of you are familiar with the Whistle Stop Trail in Farmington, the beginning of that between the parking lot and the bridge at the West Farmington end is a really good example because it slopes off very steeply on either side of that and you can sometimes get a look into the higher parts of the canopy where the birds are feeding. One thing that's really critical when selecting your location spot is be mindful of the bird's fight or flight distance. The closer you try and get to them, the less comfortable they're gonna be and they won't keep returning back to the same spot where they sometimes come to perch to feed or to sing. Um, when photographing birds, I've often heard it said that to do this effectively, you have to become a bit of a naturalist. This is why a little knowledge goes a long way when photographing birds. Um, one key thing to do in selecting a spot to photograph is watch for their territorial movement. Both these birds, this Savannah Sparrow and this common yellow throat, will return, routinely return to these spots time and time again to sit there and sing. So positioning yourself along their routine flight path around their territories is a really good way to position yourself to get really good, effective photos of the birds. Observe their behaviors. Uh, preening and hunting, much like this thrush here or this hooded warbler, always make for really interesting photos. Observe their behaviors. Uh, hunting and feeding are really good examples. Uh, in the case of this right turn zone on a beach down in Florida, it's going through routine behavior of flicking the sand of looking for what it's feeding on. Or as with this great blue heron or this osprey also down in Florida, they also make for really interesting photos as to a bird just sitting stagnantly. Nesting always makes great photos. Whether the bird is actually sitting on a nest as with this snowy plover taken down in Florida, or with this female common yellow throat who's actually bringing in nesting material, uh, which is taken in rangely. Again, this involves sitting in one spot, just watching and waiting and knowing that they're gonna keep returning in and along that path. Or as with this common loon, uh, this is actually one spot where I ended up sitting one day for eight hours straight in the middle of a marsh area, getting eaten alive by bugs to get photos like this. Or as with these two yellow warblers, which are taken out in the McGee Marsh area in Ohio, uh, coming in, building their nest. So behaviors and activities like that will always take your bird up to a new level. Territorial defense is always a great thing to photograph and that can vary from anything from simply males singing along their territory, as in the case of this black-throated green warbler, or this snowy plover driving off a ghost crab away from its nest site in Florida. Bathing is always great fun to watch with birds, with this sparrow species down in Texas, or this leaf tern also down in Florida. So behaviors are really key to 
capturing good bird photos. And one of the, the best ways to go about doing that is to observe the birds, watch what their routines are, what time of day do they do it? Where do they tend to do it? Do they return to the same spots to do it? Courtship always makes for great photos. Uh, as in the case of these two great blue herons or these laughing gulls down in Florida. Again, it's knowing what time of year they're gonna start doing this, where are they likely to do it? Whoops, sorry, went wrong way, there we go. Uh, preening also always makes for really interesting photos, particularly when they draw their feathers through their bill as in the case of this leaf turn or in this preening loon. Interaction both between adults and young as in the case of these snowy plovers or these royal terns um, these two males, one obviously didn't like the other one being there. Interaction, watch for that. Think about telling a story with your bird photos. Don't just think about bird portraits. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with bird portraits. But watch for any and all these behaviors. It will certainly take your bird photography up to a new level. Capturing flight. This is really, really challenging. Um, and it takes a lot of practice to do this. One of the key things to watch for is indications that the bird is about to take off. The previous slide, oops, did I just go the wrong way? Yes, I did. Sorry about that. I need to figure out how to go backwards here. Oh, come on. There we go. I apologize for that. If you watch this photo right here, these roseate spoonbills are actually engaging in a behavior that is sky pointing. And that indicates that they're about to take flight. So again, watch for indications of takeoff. One of the other sure things birds are likely to do is they will actually defecate right before they're about to take off, just to lighten the load just a little bit. So that's another key indication they're about to take off. Um, high film speeds or ISOs are usually essential in order to achieve the shutter speeds fast enough to freeze the birds in motion. Normally you want a minimum of one two thousandths of a second or higher. Look for an aperture that ensures the eyes are gonna be sharp. Um, use continuous autofocus if possible. There are various settings on DSLRs these days. I know in the Nikons, they refer to it as uh, group settings where you can select certain sensors that are active and they'll pass the focus off from one sensor to another as you're moving with the bird. I forget what they call it in Canon, but I know that it exists. Um, use the wind uh, to your advantage. Birds are always going to, much like pilots, will take on, will take off and land coming into the wind. So if you position yourself where you're actually upwind and you get them coming at you, or at least across the wind, that's a very effective way to capture them. And look up and practice what's known as panning. And panning is actually moving with the bird as it's flying, usually in a perpendicular path to you which makes it far easier to photograph. Getting them coming at you head on is a bit more challenging, but with practice, it can be done. Okay, what is one of the best approaches to using birds? My favorite one, particularly with these red knots on a beach down in Florida, or this, and I forget what the name of this bird is, but it's taken on a golf course in Rangeley. Um, I believe it's a horned lark. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, I tend to know, prefer what's known as the low and slow approach, which means getting down as close to, with birds like this, getting down as close to ground level as possible. 
um, moving slowly as possible. Sometimes stealth is not always the best because then you're acting a bit like a predator, particularly. So if you're standing up, usually it's still better to move a small amount, stop, move them a small amount, stop. Um, using ground plates is a really, really effective way to photograph the birds and keep the camera at above eye level. For those of you who are not sure what a ground, a ground plate is, feel free to contact me. I actually have a link or I have a blog post on the main Audubon site on how to build one for about $15 instead of spending all the money to go out and buy one. Um, one of my favorite methods for approaching birds, whether I'm crawling on my stomach or standing up is what I call the 10 move method. I probably should call it the five and 10 move method, but 10 move seems to work. What that means is I will take anywhere from five to 10 steps or crawls forward. I'll see what the bird does. If it continues in its normal behavior, be it feeding, preening, or whatever, I will take another five to 10 steps or crawls forward and see if the bird moves. The minute the bird goes on alert, you know, picks up its head, starts looking around, or it moves away from me, that's when I stop. That's when I know I've hit its fight or flight distance. Um, a lot of times I'll watch for a return to their usual behavior and then maybe try again, but usually once they've gone on alert and moved, if I move again, they're probably likely to spook and fly off. So I generally don't do that. Um, one of the clearest things is to let them come to you. Um, as in the case of these red knots, when I was photographing them on a beach in Florida, they would routinely move up and down the beach. So a lot of times if you stayed in one spot, it was reasonably certain, better than 90% chance that they were gonna come right back in front of you if you just waited and with a little bit, just a bit of patience goes a long way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one great way to get photos of birds is to take to the water. Uh, it gets you closer to hard to reach places. Um, this is my kayak actually rigged out to go on a shooting expedition for loons up at the north end of Azisca Haas Lake. Um, allow access, it allows you access to aquatic species or those that live near the water. Uh, loons are a prime example of this. It's the best way to photograph them is to get out on the water. Um, again, I will stress, don't pursue them around the lake. That's like teaching pigs to fly. Uh, waste your time and annoys the pig. One of the key things with photographing loons is that they almost routinely move each morning, will move in certain paths around their territory. One of the best ways to do that is just position yourself on a path where you know they're likely to be moving and just wait. Uh, one of the great advantages of shooting on the water, particularly in kayaks, is that it positions you low, so you're almost right down at their level. Um, use wind and current to your advantage. The, the paddle movement will sometimes spook the birds. So if you can use mother nature to help you out, that's great. Um, as again, this is the one token mammal photo in here. There's another great thing about water is it also allows you to approach relatively quietly as opposed to crashing around through the woods. And it will allow you to get close to things such as these two moose feeding in the water or this American bittern taken on the lake where I live up here. That's the only time I've actually ever seen it out there and the only time I've ever been able to successfully photograph it was from the water. So what makes a really strong bird image? Uh, it can be very, very simple things, simply as the turn of a head, as in the case of this brown thrasher taken down the panhandle of Florida, or with this cattle egret also taken down in Florida. So simple things as the turn of a head, um, so the bird's not necessarily looking straight at you. 
if you want to think of it as some fashion photographer might, is the bird striking a pose. Um, Um, let me go back one slide here. Hold on. Um, so body position, as also in the case of this brown thrasher right here. If you look at the way that the tail and the body almost form a line coming this way, there's a line, invisible line coming through the head going this way. If you look at the feet position here, again, the body position on this egret was sort of the, the bend in this neck, the way it's looking down one side, these feathers being extended out here by the wind. Um, all that stuff plays into taking your bird photography from being static to somewhat dynamic. Uh, leg position makes a simple little changes in leg position can make your bird photos really, really interesting. Is on those the slight bend in the leg of this bird here? How with this blue gray gnat catcher, one leg is positioned slightly higher than the other one on the stalk. Uh, again, looking at body position, the tail is extended and up. Think about which way the bird is looking. Frontal poses with the gaze forward, much as in the case of this osprey here. We've got one osprey Zuthi looking straight ahead. The other two are looking down this way. So the different lines created by the way they're looking lends itself greatly to the strength of the photos. Again, as with this reddish egret here, it's basically sort of in what's known as a three quarter pose. So it's not looking sort of straight at me or with this. My pelican is almost turned almost into full profile pose. So always watch for little simple things like the simple turn of a head, or if it lifts its head up. So sort of developing your own style. Um, watch for clean backgrounds whenever possible. Uh, this photo of a Carolina wren taken down to Virginia is a really prime example of uh, the background, A, being relatively clean and far enough away from the bird that it's not a distracting element by any means. Also, a lot of things I will look for in my photos. Again, if you look at the body position, it's almost in profile. The tail is lifted up. There's a slight difference in the leg position. I mean, that takes this photo up several notches. Um, look for uh, lines that lead your eye around the image. Uh, in the case of this Atlantic puffin out on Machias Seal Island, um, you're looking at the line created by the top of this rock right here lens to leading your eye around the image and actually back to the bird itself. The one thing I probably really don't care for in this image is these distracting elements back here in the background. But it was sort of unavoidable because we were sitting in a blind the way you could reposition to maneuver them out of the background. Look for frames within the frame that focus attention on where you want the viewer's eye to go or what looks interesting to you. So in the case of this bird here, and again, I'm drawing a blank on the name of this, I apologize. You'll notice that it, it's framed by the willets around it. So your eye is focused right in that area. It's also a combination of the depth of field where the birds in the front and the birds in the back are out of focus. Or in the case of this sparrow here, where it's framed by the vegetation around it, particularly in this area right here.
lighting is is always critical and and studying the lighting and how it makes the birds appear is is really key to this um silhouette shots like this are always very dramatic metering for these involves metering actually off the brightest areas of the scene probably right down in here <clears throat> achieving proper exposure for those. One of my favorite lights, in the case of this cattle egret feeding in the surf, is side lighting. It gives really nice shape and texture to birds, particularly since they tend to have very rounded bodies with not a lot of sharp defining edges to them by any means. So I, I always like side lighting. Um, the, the general rule has always been you know, photograph with the sun behind you, which I follow some of the time, but it's not my, it's not necessarily my favorite lighting. But on this American oyster catcher right here, this is a really good prime example of what is basically full, what's frontal lighting. Um, lighting is usually described in relation to the subject. Um, you'll note that it's sort of a very flat, almost one-dimensional lighting. Um, not my favorite, but again, it's fairly effective. This type of this lighting, these American avocets, which is down at Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, you'll notice that the sun, this is late in the day, the sun is basically coming in at a very low angle. So in some ways, it's almost rim lighting certain parts of the birds. Um, this, this is probably actually one of my favorite lightings for birds, is one that provides rim lighting or some degree of side lighting. This is one of my favorite things to do with birds, is looking for mirror images, as with these two male and female hooded merganser here. I love mirror images where one bird is literally reflecting the position of the other, either looking in the same direction as in the case of these two birds down here of uh, this uh, American avocet and a black neck stilt. Um, I'm also a real big fan with water birds of getting reflections of them because again it's all creating the, an inverse mirror image as in the case of this pied-billed grebe. Um, when it comes to environmental shots, don't, you don't always have to get in close to the bird in order for it to be a really effective bird photo. Um, then these photos of these two loons are a prime example of it never hurts to show some degree of their environment. It's really effective in telling a story about the birds. Or in the case of this silhouetted shot of these um, brown naughties and sooty terns, which was taken out in the Dry Tortugas National Park. Don't ever be afraid to think to flip the camera to a vertical frame or a composition. Um, this is one thing that really kind of drives me crazy when I see other photographers out in the field and they're always shooting with the camera in horizontal position. Um, particularly when photographing the wading birds, because they're so rather tall and elegant that oftentimes shooting with the frame horizontal really doesn't lend itself to them flipping the camera vertical sometimes can make a really big difference oh my god we're actually at the end early um so i'm certainly going to open this up to uh questions comments that sort of thing um if anybody wants to see any particular slides or images again to ask questions just please uh, let me know. Um, Nick, do you want me to stop screen sharing at this point? Sure, if you'd like to, uh, we can do that. I apologize, I went through that pretty quickly. I was trying to leave time for questions and I may have gone just a little bit too fast. That's all right, it's great to have time for questions. Okay, um, uh, do you want me to stop sharing? Sure, Okay. Uh, and let me, start, let me start you off with a question. Can you tell, well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I want to make sure you have a chance to see where people can tell people where they can see your photos. Uh, we have just a hint behind you of some of the uh, 
okay. stuff up on your store. Yeah, and let me, um, uh, well, there's one question here from Carl. Um, do, you, do you use back button focus? Yes, I always use back button focusing. I have been using back button focusing for years, and it is probably the best auto focusing uh, or best way to auto focus I find. Can you tell me actually what that is? I'm a, I'm a neophyte here. Um, back, back button focusing, at least on my Nikons. Um, I, let me see if I can get one. I'll show you what back button focusing is. Bear with me a second. So he's going my Nikon's, I've, I've used it so much on this camera that all the lettering on the back button focusing button is worn off. But if you look at the button that's directly above my finger, this is the back button focusing button. And what that does is it allows you so that you're focusing and you're firing the shutter becomes basically a thumb and a forefinger operation. The advantage to back button focusing is that it allows you to very effectively move the camera or keep it focused on your birds um, without having to fire the shutter button. Almost every nature photographer I knows, know, recommends, and uses back button focusing. I hope that answers the question. Cool. Um, a couple more questions coming in for you. Um, let's see here um, from John Keeter. What speed do you use when panning? John, if you mean film speed, I will tend to shoot at fairly high ISOs depending upon the lighting conditions. On average, it's anywhere from 800 to 1200 or 2000 ISO. Awesome. Um, from Jim Ferrara, uh, what kind of lens do you use for telephoto shots? And actually, maybe if, I, if you want to talk a little bit about your setup in generally, uh, right. that would be interesting. My, my setup usually depends upon what birds I'm photographing and what they're doing. If I'm going for flight shots, I will tend to use the big telephotos, but they're a little bit constricting in that they have a fairly narrow field of view. So sometimes it's very hard to keep the lens on a fast moving bird. It's really hard to shoot with them handheld because they're heavy. So I will tend to photograph moving birds with lenses similar to Nikon's 200 to 500 millimeter, simply because I can zoom in and out as the bird comes closer on its flight path. And it's easy to shoot handheld. So it's much easier to pivot this way as opposed to trying to do it with a tripod because then you have to worry about tripping over the tripod legs. Uh, for songbirds, my primarily go-to lens is are a 600 meter prime and an 800 millimeter prime uh, for two reasons, because they are so skittish that focusing on them or, or getting up close to them is really challenging. It doesn't mean you have to have those lenses to photograph songbirds. I know a lot of people that do it with handheld 200, 500 millimeter lenses and they get perfectly acceptable photos. Sometimes they've actually even get great photos. So it's not always a question of how good the equipment is. It's a question of how the quality, the, the, the length of the lenses and your approach. It, it, it's a twofold thing there. Next question. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about your typical setups or different ones you use? Uh, again, my, my typical setup, if I'm photographing songbirds, is either the 600, 800 millimeter lens usually shooting with a D850, occasionally with a flash mounted off camera that has a, um, uh, I feel it's, a, it's sort of a flash intensifier. It acts much like the Fresnel lens in a lighthouse. It focuses the light going out to the side in towards the center. Um, usually I'm not relying on the flash as a main light. I usually tend to use it as a fill just to provide improves a little bit of contrast. It allows me slightly faster shutter speeds because it's focusing more light in towards the center. 
Um, but th that's for songbirds, those are my primary go-tos. Um, I also do use them for shorebirds and wading birds also. Awesome. Uh, a question from Hannah McGee. When shooting from the water, how do you keep your equipment accessible while keeping it secure from the water? Uh, I tend to carry, I will carry my cameras in dry bags in the kayak down in between my legs. Um, I try to position the boat so that I'm not twisting with the camera out over the water, though sometimes it's necessary. I try to keep the camera located over the center line of the boat as much as possible, but definitely in dry bags, um, either large enough. I'm, if I'm just transporting in the canoe to get to a location, I'll carry them in dry bags or in pelican cases. If I'm in the kayak, I have a small dry bag that fits down in between my legs. Very cool. Um, from Barbara Peskin, do you use pinpoint focus or area focus? Uh, usually I will pinpoint focus unless I'm trying to photograph birds that are in motion. And then I'll use what is called group focus, which I'm pretty certain is close to what she's referring to as area focus. Group focus means that there's a select number of sensors that are active at any given time. And there's one that is always the prime sensor, but if the bird moves, the autofocus will pass the focus from the prime sensor off to one of the ones on either side, above or below. So the answer is I use both, but it depends upon the situation. Great. Um, a, a really interesting question here from Christine Rogers. Um, do you have any stories of uh, the one that got away? The one that got away? Um, and as a photographer, let me say, all the time, I'm, I finally get the thing up. It's in focus. As soon as I, it's finally there, it just flies away. Uh, I feel like that's constantly happening to me. Uh, oh, there are so many of those stories. That they're numerous that they probably outweigh all the successes. <laughs> um, if, I, if I have to pick the one bird that consistently gets away from me, it's the Canada warbler. I can't tell you how many times I have come this close to getting that bird and just at the last minute, poof, gone. Hmm. Yep. And sort of a similar question. Do you have a species, sort of a dream species? Yeah, the penguins in Antarctica, pick a species. Yep. Any of those. Yep. Is there a favorite bird that you like to, to track down? Sort of one that you, you know, F for favorite reason? bird. Um, actually, I would have to say that probably comes down to either black capped chickadees or gray jays or Canada jays, as they're technically known now, I believe. They just have such wonderful personalities. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, from uh, David Miller, uh, what is one of your favorite photos you've ever taken or and, and what made it your favorite? Uh, actually, I would have to say that probably the favorite in terms of being most memorable comes from a trip to Africa in 2001 with very early morning in the Maasai Mara with about five-year-old male lion walking through the grass directly towards the van. And actually I can show you the picture, hold on. Uh, where is he? Actually, for those of you who can see it, it's that picture right Whoa. there. And that's the actual picture. That is not cropped in. And How far away I, were you? Uh, 30 to 40 feet. Oh! I was standing in a van with a hatch that opened up in the top. Man. And I will tell you, when a lion looks at you, you know you've been looked at. Yeah. Holy moly. That's probably the most memorable photo ever is that one right there. I, I was actually so stunned at watching him approach. The guy had to reach over and punch me in the shoulder and say, Nick, take a picture. <laughs> did, did the lion just retreat after that? or, or uh... he, he actually just, he was one of two brothers that were the same size. And you could hear them, they were walking along going, Oof. 
calling for the females. And he walked literally around the back of the van, about 10 feet away from it, and just kept right on going. Man, oh man, that's very cool. Not something you have to worry about in Rangeley, thankfully. Uh, that's great. Um, a couple more questions here. One uh, from Susan. Uh, tell us about the images behind you on the wall. Uh, which image is she asking about? I'm not sure, but we see that we see some leaves and I believe some some water. Uh, yeah, the waterfall up there. Okay. The brown um, one, she says. The brown one looks like leaves. The brown. Okay, the leaves. That's a macro shot that was taken on the National Mall in Washington D.C. No way. One fall, huh. um, and it's actually um, the, fo the foliage is starting to sort of dry up, and it's actually covered in frost. Lovely. If I get up close to it, oops, maybe you can see it a bit better. I'm trying to juggle it on not pulling a power cord out of the computer here. Of course, part of the sofa's in the way, but. Oh, Susan says amazing. That's where she is right now. Uh, is, that, is that photo, Nick, available on your website, touchthewildphotos.com? I believe so, yes. If not, hey. it will be. <laughs> All right, great. Um, Another uh, question from Valerie. Um, any thoughts about the newer mirrorless cameras or sticking with DSLRs? Uh, I'm looking at the new mirrorless cameras, uh, one reason being for their weight. The one drawback I find with the mirrors at this point is that pretty much my current list of lenses aren't designed to work on them unless you get some sort of an adapter. Yeah. Um, and I'm not really comfortable with that idea at this point. I've got so much money invested in what I've got now. Um, I'm certain at some point a mirrorless is going to be somewhere down the road. I'm just not there yet. I, I, in terms of image quality, I've talked to friends of mine in the UK that use mirrorless and or one friend in particular, he swears by it. Hmm. I've well, heard I a lot of people yeah. sort of uh, really growing in, in attraction. If you yeah. actually... Because they, because they pulled off that filter that goes over the there's no mirror in it so it's basically a direct line of sight straight onto the sensor yeah i believe that there are you know definite improvements in the image resolution but i haven't looked into it that seriously gotcha so 1050 i see um any other questions for nick we got a few minutes left and i want to thank you all again for fighting through the uh, craziness of uh a couple hours ago uh, we are back and stronger than ever um, nothing shakes us here at the well, range. We, we have another us. question. Yep. What do you think of tele-extenders? Tele-extenders? Um, I use them on occasion. I avoid the 2X tele-extenders like the plague. Simply, simply the, the reason being is um, it, the, the, it degrades the image quality too much to use one of those things. It's too much. You're adding too much glass or too much more glass in between your subject and the image. I do use the one four and the one seven occasionally, but with using those things, you really have to be very careful about um, vibration going up and down the lens barrel. And you wanna be um, very careful about, because you're extending the length of the lens, you wanna make sure that your shutter speeds are fast enough to avoid any vibration up and down the lens barrel causing uh, sharpness issues. Hmm. Interesting. Um, what is the best week to see loons with babies safely for pictures? Um, Albert, first, I hope that a answered your question about tele-extenders. If not, please let me know. What is the best week to see loons with So if, if you want to photograph baby loons uh, from a safe distance, of course, uh, as she uh, clarified, uh, when would you want to do that? And I can say um, it's about, it's in July generally, right? I would generally say in early July. Um, and again, that's the situation where you have to approach them very, very, very carefully. Yeah. Um, that's where the fight or flight distance really comes into it. As that photograph of that nesting loon, that was a bird that I had spent a great deal of time observing. And I knew exactly how close I could get to that nest without spooking them. Um, but in general, if you're looking for a time, uh, plan on early July, but bear in mind that usually if they've got two chicks, the chicks usually hatch about 24 hours apart. 
And within a matter of hours of the second tick hatching, usually within 24 hours, they will abandon the nest site. And they'll take the ticks out into a nursery cove somewhere, in which case you're then gonna have to get out in the water and photograph them. Um, um, do you print your photos in your shop? Uh, everything except the panoramas, yes. Okay. Um, any, um, Why how much aftershocks processing do you use? How much aftershocks? I'm not sure what aftershocks processing is. So not much, I guess, is the answer there. Um, um, but to yep. sort of answer that question, I keep my processing down to the bare minimum possible. Uh, I, I subscribe to the theory that it's best to get it right in camera and spend as little time in front of the computer as possible. Um, That's fun. Uh, oven, oven bird tips. Uh, for oven birds, um, find spots similar to that part of the slideshow. If you didn't see it, I'll be happy to share it with you again, where they have um, the sort of open stands of deciduous trees is probably one of the best spots to look for oven birds. Uh, get in there, observe where the birds are, watch how they tend to move around if they have certain perches they um, come to regularly within their territory. Find one of those spots, sit there and wait. Um, you can chase oven birds around through a spot like that all day long and you'll probably end up with nothing but frustration. Um, interesting question from Kayla. Um, why do you take photos? Uh, that's a really good question. It's a deep question then. To that, maybe that's, a end very, on that's a very deep question. And I guess <laughs> the, to answer that question as succinctly as possible, it's in my blood. Um, and years ago, when a family member passed away, we went out to New York and I discovered that my paternal grandfather, whom I actually never knew, uh, while being a physician by trade, was a very skilled amateur photographer. So, and since I first started taking photographs uh, when I was in college, I got hooked and I've been hooked ever since. That's great. Um, let's see here. So any other questions? We have a few minutes left um, and <clears throat> I've put, let me put it again. Um, oop, I don't have it up. Um, I put Nick's uh, website in the chat a couple times. Let me get it again. Um, and you have a store in town. Is that right? Nick, tell us, tell us about where you are right now. That is correct. I actually run a uh, gallery located here on Main Street, Rangeley, which is open seasonally uh, throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Um, when I'm not here, I actually spend winters down in Florida. I have a partner who lives on Sanibel Island and we lead bird photography tours and workshops and along the Gulf Coast of Florida, particularly in the Sanibel Fort Myers area. Um, so yes, that's pretty much what I do in a nutshell. Um, all, all the information about um, the workshops is on my website. I see Barbara had a question about photo workshops this summer. Yes, I do have workshops scheduled. Um, and generally, those tend to be scheduled when it's uh, when people can get up here. Uh, I'm generally available for those on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of each week. Awesome. Um, uh, Deborah, there were 34 slides in this show. Actually, 35 because the one with the video was new. All right. Well, Nick Ledley, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This was fantastic. Um, we really look forward next year for you giving a sort of an in, uh, you know in-person walk photography demonstration. We were really excited to um, do an on-the-ground Ring Superintendent Festival photography workshop slash walk slash cool stuff. So uh, stay tuned for next year. Please come up to the Ranging Birding Festival. Just, just visit one Nick's quick thing, Nick. If, if, yep. if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact me through my website. And I would be more than happy to arrange a sort of a one-on-one -on -one Zoom uh, discussion with anybody if they want to do so. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick.
Um, and we'll, we have a few minutes left, so we'll um, just hold on here. Uh, and in just a few minutes, Brian Olson from the University of Maine is going to come on to give his keynote, which I'm very thrilled about. I saw him come on, and so he's ready to go. So um, everybody, if we could just thank Nick one more time, um, that would be really great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.